What is it? A little, it's a little camcorder. So this little thing gives a uh, that way that way if um, if you know Al Qaeda comes in here to take me out, I'll have a record of it. <laughs> See, when you when you write thrillers, you think along these lines. You know. I don't think they're the ones you got to worry about. Not anymore. It's, uh, yeah, they've got a lot of competition. They're more local now. <laughs> okay, it's being two o'clock. Uh, uh, First thing I, I want to know, my, my name is Robert Bidinato, that's how you pronounce it, so BS, and uh, I'm a thriller writer, and I write um, a, a series called the, the Dylan Hunter Thriller Series, and I'll tell you a little more about that later, and maybe <coughs> read a brief passage from one of the books. Uh, I'm interested in you, and uh, I had asked before, I think all of you showed up, um, how many people here well, all of you, I assume, are readers. You're all readers. That's a good thing. Um, he's not sure. Um, how many here are readers who are aspiring to be writers? Okay. Okay, got about five. How, how many people here are actual, they've, you've written something and are maybe awaiting publication or would like to get it published? Okay, two. And uh, does anyone here have something that they have published, either self-published or you have? Okay, and you have. If you've either self-published or, or traditionally published, one of the... Okay. Pardon? Do, do magazines count? Of course. Sure. <laughs> Absolutely. I just, I like to know who I'm chatting with because uh, what I want to do today is I want to uh, uh, share some thoughts that I think are relevant to all readers and for people who want to be writers of fiction, which is my big. I used, uh, just by way of background, in my uh, 65 years now, uh, I have mostly been a nonfiction writer. Come on in. Hi. Grab a chair anywhere. Uh, I've, uh, I started out in, in uh, started out in, uh, in my life as a nonfiction writer. When I say started out in my life, I started writing when I was really young. Um, I was the kind of kid that when the teacher said, um, I gave you the essay assignment when you came back to school, you had the summer vacation. How did you spend your summer vacation? And you had to write something. And so I would write, you know, chapter one, I did this, I did this. Chapter two, a UFO landed in my backyard. <laughs> and yeah, and I was like transported by the UFO into outer space, and it just, and so I would, I, even then, I was making up stories and having, having a grand time, and the teachers recognized that uh, writing is what I really wanted to do. I, that, uh, that's something I always wanted to do, but I didn't know how to make a living at it or what that would entail. Uh, grew up, had some advice and help from some uh, special teachers along the way. And when I uh, went to college, however, I majored in economics. Uh, I decided after about two years I was no longer interested in economics. So I decided I needed to, sure, go sit anywhere. Uh, I decided I needed to um, figure out what I wanted to do with writing. So I started out writing reviews for newspapers and magazines. I wrote for, uh, when I was a kid, I wrote for my hometown newspaper, uh, Letters to the Editor I started. And then I started, uh, later on I was doing book reviews. I did uh, lots of little organizations, magazines and newsletters I was writing for. And then I, I got very fortunate. I, I uh, met so at a party an editor for Reader's Digest. And um, he and I hit it off and he asked me to send some of the stuff that I'd written. Uh, we got on pretty well, and uh, and so I got my first assignment from Reader's Digest in 1986. Uh, 1987, my first article appeared in Reader's Digest, and the second one that appeared was a crime-focused story that got a huge amount of attention. It uh, had an impact on the 1988 presidential campaign. Um, after after that, they expected that Reader's Digest expected. A grand slam home run for me every time I would submit something. So uh, it would take me months and months to write an article, 
and, I, and while I was getting notoriety, I was not getting very much of an income. So anyway, fast forward, I had always had at the top of my bucket list, write a novel. And I, have, I had taken all kinds of notes over the years and tried out a lot of different ideas. And I kept putting it off and putting it off. I was scared. I, didn't, I, was, I was pretty good at writing nonfiction, but writing characters, dialogue, plotting, and all that stuff, that's a whole different animal. And so I didn't know that I could do it. So what I did is I kept putting it off until I, the most fortunate thing in my life happened uh, about, I would say maybe five years ago, it was 2008. I lost my job as a magazine editor. And the reason that that was a good thing is that I, here it is, the middle of the recession. I'm, uh, at the time, over 60 years old. And I it said, uh, man, what am I going to do now? How are we going to pay the bills? And so with my dear wife's blessing, I finally decided to dust off my notes and write a novel. That novel turned out to be this guy. So this is the shop copy. It's a little worn here. But um, uh, Hunter. And I had made up my mind that I was going to publish it on my six, by my 62nd birthday, which was June 5th, 2011. On June 4th, 2011, at 11 p.m., the last pages were coming out of my printer the last the manuscript pages. Thanks to the wonders of self-publishing, uh, I was able to put this out as an oh. e-book um, just 17 days later. I had a whole bunch of beta readers ready and for the manuscript, so the minute the, the last pages came out, I shipped off uh, PDF files and uh, 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 e-book files to everybody that I had lined up. They came back and they saved my butt. They found all kinds of errors that you're going to find in any book. And uh, so I, I published this thing, and then it was about maybe three weeks, two to three weeks after that, the print edition, this print edition came out. And um, it sold well for the next five months. And then I was, uh, selling well means I sold about 4,000 copies in the five months. And uh, not huge bestseller numbers, but, but good numbers. And then Amazon did me a great favor. The Amazon editors, uh, the Kindle editors, saw that the book was getting great ratings and it was selling well. And they invited me to participate in a promotion post Thanksgiving 2011. And they said, the only thing you got to agree to is that we're going to cut the price on your ebook from $3.99 down to $1.99. And I went, um, oh, and I said, well, I, I talked to the wife again about it, and, and Cynthia said, um, well, what do you got to lose? And I said, well, I'll probably make you about a week's income because this is a week-long promotion, but uh, we'll see what happens. Well, I went to bed um, on, uh, when was it, November 26th, and I was ranked on Amazon about maybe number 2,000. I woke up the next morning and I was ranked like 28. And I went, wait a minute. So I went on and, and Amazon allows you to self, when you're self publishing, they allow you to click on um, a chart that shows you how your sales are going. And if they're like in real time, if they're ebook sales, they show you a, a real time feedback. So I start, I clicked because I didn't believe it. And there were like two more books sold. I clicked again, another book sold. I clicked again. I was thought I was doing it. I clicked again. <laughs> the long and short of it was in I sold fifty thousand copies in the next thirty-five days. It went to number four on Kindle. It went to number one in mysteries and thrillers. Um, it went to number one in romantic suspense. Uh, the only people ahead of me was uh, the Hunger Games lady. She had two books ahead of uh, well, she had, she had two books ahead of me, and I actually beat her latest book. Yes. Um, but I was ahead of everybody. Uh, Stephen King, Lee Child. Uh, there was another romance writer, Barbara Freethy, who uh, was ahead of me. 
she was in number two. The Hunger Games lady was in number one and number three, and I was in number four. I was the alpha male on Kindle. <laughs> so that was, that was kind of cool. Uh, at any rate, that changed my life, my wife's life, obviously, and, uh, and it allowed me to do this full time now. Uh, I'm a slow writer, and it took me forever to get the second book out, but the second book came out, and it's done well. Nowhere near as well as the first book, but it's, it's doing well, and uh, it's getting better reviews than the first book did. So, that's me. Why do we like stories? You know, I, I was thinking about that, um, and I also read a really interesting book by a professor of English named Jonathan Gottschall. He wrote a book called The Storytelling Animal. Wonderful book. And he believes we're wired for stories as human beings. And uh, as much as I was trying to think about it, it, it uh, why it is that we're so compelled by stories. Why do we watch TV? Why do we watch movies? Why do we read fiction? Why do we read uh, novels all the time? What is it about storytelling? that's so profoundly important to all of us. And several things. Uh, when we're really little and we're trying to understand cause and effect in the world, how the world works, um, what happens when we're really small? Our parents tell us stories. They sit down with a little storybook and we, they start reading stories to us. And the stories explain things to us in a very, very primitive way. When you think of primitive tribes, what do they do? They don't understand what lightning is. They don't understand why the water is flowing. They, don't feel, they feel wind in their face and they don't know what comes. So they come up with people. And they populate, they animate the entire universe with creatures who are, going, or who are doing these things. And they, somebody sits around this campfire and everybody else is enthralled because the storyteller is explaining it all to them. Thus, the birth of mythology, of religions, of, of, of just about everything we know. We are, from the earliest and most primitive time, both personally and, I think, tribally, if you will, we're wired for stories. Stories explain to us how the world works and how the world ought to work. And um, as we mature, there's an important thing that happens to us. When we're little, we're in a very comfort zone uh, stage with our parents. Our parents take care of all of our needs, all of our wants, all of our, uh, all of our desires. We cry, and then they come over with the bottle or whatever, change us. And we learn very early on that this is a really comfortable world. However, <coughs> we start growing up and going out, and then we start skinning our knees. Then we start, we, we take action, we start learning more things, making decisions, and we start running into problems. And as we run into problems and challenges, our experience of life is very different from this womb that we were, uh, we were uh, in pre-gestation or, or during gestation, and this womb-like environment we had as infants. And now we are out there trying to uh, navigate the world. And we encounter some very basic things. We encounter challenges. We encounter the need to take effort. We need to, to face risks. All of our efforts don't succeed. We find out we can fail. We find out that failing isn't pleasant. Sometimes it physically hurts. Sometimes it just psychologically hurts. And so as we go through life, we hit these different stages. What I think Gail Sheehy in her old book called Passages, we hit these different stages in our lives. And guess what happens with stories? Stories, and I'm talking about the three, three act structure in a moment, they sort of pattern right after the stages of our lives. Stories um, have a beginning, a middle, and an end, just as our lives do. And what happens at the beginning of a story, we're in a comfort zone, the characters in the story are in a comfort zone. And then all of a sudden, there's this awakening, there's this uh, uncomfortable uh, spot that, that um, the characters reach early on in the story in which there's a call to action, a call to adventure. And then from that point on, the events of the story are almost 
allegorically like our own lives and our own maturation and growth. I think our kinship with stories grows out of things like that. They're that basic to us. They, um, we identify with certain stories and certain characters because their values, their worldviews, parallel our own experiences, parallel our own values and, uh, and uh, experiences. And we can find uh, uh, watching other characters that are dealing with these ca uh, challenges, making decisions, facing risks, taking adventures and so forth, they, they can inspire us, they can inform us, but we can relate to those characters. And that's why we find an author that we really love. Why? Their worldview and their character's worldview mirrors in many respects our own or our aspirational self, what we want to be, what we want to see happen. Or they're dealing with a threat that's always been, by analogy, some sort of a threat or fear of our own challenge for ourselves. So this is one of the reasons that we find stories so, so we're obsessively interested in stories. People tell us stories. Um, politicians learn to tell stories. <laughs> um, and you'll find that the most effective communicators of stories are the most effective, or, or uh, you know, effective politicians. Doesn't mean that they're right. But if they've got a good story that resonates with lots and lots of people, that's how they're going to get elected. A successful storyteller is skilled at touching these emotional and intellectual hot buttons, um, these chords in us that they inspire us, um, they inform us, they identify with us, and their characters do. So. As I was thinking about it, it occurred to me that stories are like waking dreams, except that the storyteller isn't just daydreaming. He has a directed, purposeful daydream. You know, we all sit around and have fantasies and daydreams, but a storyteller, a skilled storyteller, is a person who can sit there and um, daydream and direct the daydream in a certain pattern. And the more that pattern reflects what I was just talking about, that structure of our own lives, uh, it follows that story arc. The, the more effectively they can do that and the more effectively their values and their worldview parallel our own or touch on our own, uh, I think the more successful the storyteller can be. So where, how do authors go about creating a fictional universe? How do these storytellers actually do what they do? Anybody who's ever written fiction is asked constantly, where do you get your ideas? Where do your ideas come from? They're all over the place. I mean, anything that strikes your fancy can be the basis of a story, anything. Um, you see uh, three red cars in a row go down the, go down the street. Say, gee. If there was a story, I wonder, suppose they were all together. Suppose this was some, this meant something. What could it mean? Um, yeah, you know, um, you see birds suddenly take off from a tree. What made them take off? Is there something out there? You know, anything can provoke a story. A newspaper headline, a newspaper story, something you saw on TV, somebody else's story. All of these things can provoke the germ of an idea for a story. But what do you do with that? Well, um, uh, I think storytellers really do need a good imagination. But what a story, the discipline of the storyteller, of the person who does this regularly, is that a storyteller will say, what would happen if? You take this germ of an idea, this inspiration, and you say, what would happen if blah, blah, blah? What would happen if those three cars, if those were government vehicles, and the people in them were you know, dressed in plain clothes, and they were on some sort of a secret mission? Um, what would happen if a girl from um, this a plantation in the pre-Civil War South were to run into this, this handsome guy from, a, from Charleston? What would happen if this sort of thing, a 
Storyteller starts out by asking questions. And the writing process itself is a constant process of asking and answering questions. You say, okay, what would happen if, well, so she meets this guy from Charleston. Well, where did she meet him? Meet him? How could she meet him? Who is this girl? Who is this guy? You're asking questions. Well, what if she were, you know, some headstrong, pretty headstrong girl, had lots of boyfriends and so forth? Um, what, but what, what's, what's going to keep, you know, she's going to stay on this plantation. What's going to happen to her if she just does that? There's no story there. Well, what would happen if she was really madly in love with a guy who wasn't in love with her? But then this stranger came along, and he, he was smitten by her. Oh, that's good. We got sort of like a triangle going on here. And then what would happen if, and you go on and on and on. You keep asking the questions. How old are they? What's their backgrounds? What are their attitudes? What are their values? Uh, what are their goals? What are they after in life? And the way this works is that every story ultimately that you're working on is going to come, come down to some sort of a theme that's going to have a point to it. And you're going to have to have characters who are orchestrated around that theme. They're going, to, they're going to represent that theme in some way. Now, you might not start out with a theme. Uh, that might not be the, the way it works for you at all. You can start a story anywhere. You can start with an idea for a character. You can start with the three cars going down the street. You can start with anything at all. You grab on, but then after that, it's a matter of asking the questions and teasing out implications and trying to put them into some sort of a meaningful, interesting pattern. Um, you, that interesting pattern, if you write a plot story, as opposed to, there are stories that don't have plots, then it's a perfectly legitimate choice. I write plot stories. And what a plot is, it's a logical, causal, projection or a progression of events. It's logical. One thing leads to the other. They're cause and effect related. And there's, uh, they go from point A to a point B in the distant horizon. But everything fits together logically and um, uh, in, in, in this, this progression. A plot obviously has to be in, involve characters. The characters have to be, if you want a really good story, the characters have to be in collision with each other. The main characters have to have contrary goals, and that's what leads to drama. And then the setting of a story, well, you can set a story anywhere. I mean, what could be more boring than a, uh, a girl who is, say, a housekeeper? Um, or a, um, uh, you know, guardian for, for children, hired guardian for the kids. Work in Jane Eyre. Work in The Sound of Music. Uh, you can see where you can go with it. You set these anywhere. And, you know, if you're a thriller writer, you try to set it someplace exotic. In mind, around this area, Washington, D.C. area, a lot of things, machinations going on in Washington, D.C., nation's capital. So you can do, you can set the, the, the plot anywhere. But the key things that are going to touch it off are going to be the characters and their goals, what they're after. A story has a couple of basic requirements. Every story needs a story goal. It has to go somewhere, go from point A to point B. And so does each character in the story. Each character has to have their own goals. And the most effective stories are the ones in which the characters are well orchestrated, they're well matched, and they have clashing goals. Their goals collide with each other. Uh, my first, my, my first story, um, Man and a Woman. How many people here have seen the, the film, either version of the Thomas Crown Affair? You, you, you know the, the story at all, the Thomas Crown Affair? Anyway, it's a cat and mouse story. It's a caper movie. Um, uh, and one, uh, Steve McQueen was in the first version with Faye Dunaway. The second version was um, uh, uh, Pierce Brosnan and Rene Rousseau. Uh, both of these guys in, this, uh, in each version was a billionaire, billionaire playboy type. And for diversion, 
they stole art. They didn't need the money, they just stole art. And, and, and the girl in both of these is an insurance investigator. And they're the insurance investigator is trying to find out who did the theft. And very early in the story, the cat <coughs> figures out who the mouse is. And very early in the story, the mouse figures out that she's a cat. But that doesn't stop them from falling in love. So you have this clash of emotions with the, uh, the clashing goals of the two characters. In Hunter, a similar kind of thing occurs. There's a cat and mouse. The woman is the cat. She's an investigator of a, of a kind. And the man is a mouse. He is, he's got a secret past. In my story, they meet, they fall in love, but they don't know they are the cat and the mouse. And the reader does. And the reader loves these two characters and going through and going, oh my gosh, but, oh, what's going to happen when they, when they realize, you know? And, and so the, the, the suspense in the story comes from the idea of uh, what happens when these two very wonderful, likable, admirable people find out that they're the last people on the planet who should be together. Uh, by circumstance, not by their, their soulmates, but they, they, they just, you can be soulmates and then have circumstances make things very awkward. So, each of the characters needs a goal. And the story question is the other element that's really necessary. And that is, the question is, will the character achieve his goal or fail? In Gone with the Wind, will, uh, will, uh, Scarlet get Ashley? No. Will she get Rhett? And will Rhett get Scarlet? No. So you had a thwarted, they did for a while, and then it all fell apart, you know, that it was um, uh, a tragedy at the end of Gone with the Wind. But the question, the story question, and the story goal is what builds suspense. You pose the question early on when you're writing a story. You set, set things up so that the there's a, there are questions immediately. And what keeps people turning pages and turning pages and turning pages is that question mark. What's going to happen next? And a skilled storyteller knows that when they get to certain points, they're going to say, well, I've reached a point in the pacing of this where people are going to start getting bored. I've got to go. I've got to throw something else into the mix here now. Mix it up again. A complication that's going to put that story question into doubt again and ram the story question right in front of their eyes and they're going to wonder, well, my gosh, uh, you know, just as they were starting to maybe stop, uh, think about stop turning pages or put the book down for the evening, suddenly you threw them a curve. And the best comment that a writer can get from readers is you kept me up all night you know I, I went to work went to work uh, the next day I was, a, I was a zombie because I was up till four o'clock in the morning finishing your book you know and they usually swear at you and all that sort of thing uh, the best compliment I ever got was apparently um, and I don't know whether it was the man or the woman but two newlyweds went on their honeymoon and somebody wrote me saying that their new spouse had my first book with them on the honeymoon. And they were really upset <laughs> with me. And I go, yes! <laughs> That's, uh, you, you can't get better music to a writer's ears than, uh, uh, than something like that. You, they had to keep turning the pages. So it's the story question and the goals that generate suspense. Now, I've passed out uh, a sheet there. And the one with the chart on the back there, the three-act structure. The, the, uh, uh. Yeah, so if you, there's extra copies on each. Um, take a look at that. I will guarantee you that well over 90% of the stories that you read, uh, over 90% of the stories that you read or watch on TV or in the movies follow this general rough pattern. <coughs> there are variations, but the three-act structure
structure is in Act 1, there's a setup. Act 2, a sequence of increasing disasters. And then in Act 3, it's, it's the end. That's called the story arc. <coughs> and this is built around the development of two or three disasters that are uh, positioned throughout the book, without, throughout the story. Let's just call it a story because it might be a movie. Um, you punctuate the beginning, middle, and end with these disasters. Uh, and they're points that connect the acts together, the three acts, the progression of the events. Act one takes up about 25% uh, or so, 20%, 25% of the story. Um, it, it rising tension, for, it starts out with this um, people in the normal world, in their normal lives, normal situation. All of a sudden there's this activating event, whatever it is. Scarlett O'Hara, she's on her porch doing fiddle dee dee with the Tarleton twins at the beginning of Gone with the Wind. Um, uh, oh, which shall I take to the ball? You know, she's going on and on and having, having a grand time. But then she hears Ashley Wilkes is going to get married. And she's been, she's set her cap for Ashley Wilkes and she's shocked. I don't believe it. Um, the activating event is not just that, that message, but her confirmation when the ball takes place. That party takes place at, uh, what is it, Twin Oaks? I can't remember the name of the, the Twin Oaks. Um, and it's Ashley's place, and he, he says that he's going to marry Olivia, Olivia, yeah, Olivia de Havilland, uh, uh, Melanie. And, and that is a huge disaster for uh, Scarlett. Um, she's devastated about this. At the same time, um, um, Rhett Butler shows up, and war is declared. So you've got your activating the, the event, the first disaster, the call to action for all these characters, the, the, the generating event that puts everything into motion. So uh, at this point, at the end of that, the, the protagonist, whether it's a male or female, is mm -hmm. propelled into action. <laughs> they have to do something now. And so uh, Ash, uh, yeah, uh, um, Scarlett makes some very bad choices, but she's propelled into action to, uh, to um, counter this first disaster. Act two takes up about this, if you think of it like a football game with four quarters, uh, the second and third quarter are act two. And what happens at, at, during act two are all the complications. You know, the people start colliding with each other with their clashing goals. Uh, there are all kinds of setbacks for the protagonist. Um, uh, <coughs> there are um, other people who come in to complicate matters. Um, and, 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 you know, you think of how many marriages that Scarlett had along the way. Um, she was always having, having these problems with men, and things are never quite working out. But then, in the middle of Act Two, about, right at about the middle point of the book, if it's a book or a movie or a TV show, TV series, there is a big twister room. There is an event that occurs. It, can, it could be a calamity, but it's something that sets things on their ear. Um, in Gone with the Wind, <coughs> yeah, the burning of Atlanta, the whole scene from the burning of Atlanta, Melanie has her baby in the middle of the burning of Atlanta. Uh, Scarlett is committed against her will to taking care of, uh, of the woman she hates and the baby. And they have to escape. And, uh, and um, uh, at the same time, uh, Rhett Butler abandons her. He's going to go off to war now. Pretty bad. And then she gets home to Tara. And Tara's in ruins. And her husband is walking around like Hamlet's ghost. He's a zombie. And her mom is dead. And there's no food. And there's no nothing. You talk about a disaster. You think you have troubles? I mean, this, this, this girl had some troubles. There, there was no, no milk for the baby, all this kind of thing. So, the middle of the movie, 
She's out there in the fields chewing on turnips, raw turnips, and throwing up and all that. And then she stands up, and it's right in the, you know how the, the middle of a movie works, because she goes up and says, God is my witness. I'll never grow hungry again if I have to lie and kill and all of those things. That's right in the middle of the movie. And you know that because then the lights come up and there's, a, there's an intermission. Um, and that's the way Gone with the Wind, the movie works. But it fits the pattern. There's this sudden turnabout, and she's made a decision. She'll never go hungry again, whatever she has to do. So we're into, we're into the third quarter of the four-quarter game, the last half of, the, of Act Two. During that period of time, the direction of the story changes, and after a brief recovery period where you see them on the farm, and Ashley's trying to farm, and... Uh, and uh, Melanie's trying to raise their baby and so forth. Uh, and everything, everything seems to slow down a little bit after the big disaster. And then the tension starts uh, ramping up again. And we're going to head for another decisive catastrophe or another big turning point that leads right into the climax of the story. And the catastrophe is going to force the hero or heroine to commit to the end of the story, to commit, there's gonna be some big confrontation scene. Now, you know that during this whole period in Gone with the Wind, Ashley and, or, or, uh, uh, Ashley and Scarlet have been having their, their little pas de deux and, they, they're, and he's, he's resisting her and uh, she's, still, uh, she's still carrying the torch for him and Rhett is, furious at this whole thing, and, but all these complications occur. Then we reach a, a, the final disasters. The, the baby's dying. Bonnie falls off the horse. Tra tragedy. Disaster. Sets Rhett Butler into crazy land. And, um, and uh, it essentially wrecks their marriage, this, this whole thing. So you get that final climactic disaster, and then the rest of it is gonna be resolution. How's this all going to work out? Uh, is she going to, are they gonna be able to save their marriage, uh, or what's, what's going to happen? And if you haven't seen Gone with the Wind, go see Gone with the Wind, and we'll see what happens. So I'm not gonna tell you. Um, it leads to this final confrontation that occurs between, and that was, by the way, the confrontation in the movie that won Patty McDaniel, her Oscar, where she's, where um, uh, Melanie comes over to, uh, to Tara, or yeah, it was, I think it was Tara, yeah, and uh, Rhett is locked in his room with the, with the dead baby, the dead little girl, right? Remember that? No. But she, she's locked, he's, he's locked himself, he w doesn't, won't talk to anybody, he is beside himself, he's out of his mind. And Patty McDaniel, as uh, Melanie arrives, Patty McDaniel tearfully tells the entire story, narrates what has happened between Scarlet and Rhett. And that as they're walking slowly up the stairs and uh, Melanie's looking ahead, Patty McDaniel's, uh, the, the maid, um, Manny, is stealing the scene <laughs> by just this incredible narration of the events. And you're going, Oh no! You know you want to cry to just uh, just want, uh, listening to her. Uh, so Hattie McDaniel, uh, playing Manny, won the Oscar for that performance going up the stairs, um, yeah, and um, it led to that. That was the climactic event confrontation between Rhett and Scarlet, and as a result of that, the die was cast, and that that means that the story question was answered. Will they? What's going to happen to these characters? And that was resolved in the third act, when uh, uh, <coughs> Rhett Butler, you know, the final thing was, frankly, my dear, I, uh, dear, I don't give a damn. And he walks off to, to this wonderful music by Max Steiner, you know, marching. It was marching music as he's walking off into the fog, you know. Uh, at any rate, at any rate, that's gone with the wind. But you see, it follows a three-act structure. And you will find that most stories that you're familiar with do follow that three-act structure. And the endings can be sad like that, bittersweet, or happy. The heroes 
or heroine or the protagonist in the story can achieve their victory. Um, I'm going to I'm going to do something I really shouldn't do in, t in talking about my own books. If you're looking for an unhappy ending, you're not going to get them in my books. <laughs> okay. Um, if you like cynical endings, if you like downbeat endings and all that, read somebody else's books. But my my book, I put my characters through ever loving hell, but at the end they're going to have a happy ending. So they're so that that is a promise that I make to readers for forever. Uh, you'll you'll love the endings of the stories. Because, yeah, yeah. The ending of, the, of Hunter makes everybody cheer, and the ending of Bad Deeds goes, "Wow, I didn't believe it." You know. All so. Um, let me take a few minutes, and then we'll get into questions. A few minutes to talk about ways to write a novel. For those people who are interested in writing a novel, or those people who are readers and just curious about how novelists do this weird stuff. There are a bunch of different methods, as many, probably as many unique methods as there are writers. Um, a very common method is simple seat of the pants writing. It's called seat of the pants. Uh, and the people who do this are called pantsers. Uh, trust me. Um, and what pantsers do is that they get an idea in their head. They go, I wonder what I can do with this. And they sit down at their typewriters or rather keyboards, whatever it happens to be, or longhand if they're, if they're as old as I am. And they. Um, they start, they start, they grab the thing and they just start writing. And they see where it's going to go. And they come up with characters and events and things along the way. Now usually that's going to require a lot of editing later on. Because you're going to go down a lot of dead ends if you start that way, seat of the pants. But if they love, most of the people who choose that method are spontaneous people who love the creative act and they, they just love the process of writing and the process of being creative along the way. Who were some of the famous Seat of the Pants writers? Lee Child, Stephen King, um, Vince, the late Vince Flynn. I have a friend, uh, Stephen England, who writes big, long, complicated thrillers. Um, he's Seat of the Pants. These, these folks usually have to go back and do a lot of editing. Although Lee Child claims that he writes essentially first drafts and maybe somebody cleans up uh, uh, you know, some of the proofreading along the way. Vince Flynn started out as a plotter, but he turned into a seat of the pants writer uh, later on in his career. But they like the spontaneity of the process. Uh, a second way to write a, can be called edit as you go. Edit as you write. Um, like a, a, a seat of the pants person will write a little bit, and, but then they'll periodically stop, and they'll go back, and they'll refine what they had written before, before they proceed. And they'll shoot ahead a little bit farther. And then they'll stop again, go back, edit, fix things. They'll get new ideas, and they'll shape it, and then they'll go, go ahead. Um, the, the horror writer, uh, Dean Koontz, does that method. He's a, he's a famous um, edit-as-you-write fellow. Then there is the plotter. P L O, yeah, P L O T T E R, not plotter. Um, and a plotter <coughs> organizes things in advance. This is a guy who um, maybe is a little OCD, who wants to know. He doesn't want to go, you know, write himself into corners and go down the road into dead ends. And so the plotter will try to plan things out ahead of time. He, he wants to know a lot about his characters ahead of time. He wants to have the general outline, at least a general outline of the story, maybe a really, really detailed outline of the story before he goes on. Um, and um, there are variations on, on that. There are people who, who shape their outline, that they will outline things. Sometimes it's you know chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, section one, section two, section three. That's me. I do that. I am a plotter. Uh, part of the reason is that I start with, with controversial themes. And in order for me to prevent, present these themes, 
convincingly, what I have to do is I start out, uh, well, I'll, I'll explain that in a second. I want to go through these and, and I'll explain what I do. But um, the guy who wrote this book, which, and, and despite his title, I highly, highly, highly recommend to anybody who wants to write. It's called uh, Writing Fiction for Dummies. I think it's the most comprehensive book out there on this, this topic. It's excellent. Uh, the author, the main author is a guy named Randy Ingermanson. He fashions himself the America's mad professor of, of fiction writing. And he's very, very good. But Randy is a plotter, and he has his own unique method. He calls it the snowflake method, and that's, that's in his book uh, also. He, he describes these different things. Then finally, there's a, a thing where that I would describe, I would use the term, the synopsis method. And the way this is, is that a person starts writing out in a narrative form the story idea. Um, you know, it's a once upon a time sort of thing. Um, we start out the story by meeting so-and-so and so-and-so, and, -so, and they are in this situation, and they go on. And it's, he starts out writing an essay about it. It might be five or six pages the first time through. Then they'll sit back and they'll say, well, here are complications I haven't thought about. They'll write a new draft of that. And this time it might be 10 or 15 pages long. And it solves a lot of the preliminary problems. And they, maybe they'll consolidate some of the characters. Maybe they'll get rid of some of the characters. But then finally what happens is that they continue on this process with draft after draft, and they got something really big and long at the end. And um, famous writers who use this, do this sort of thing, that I call it synopsis method. Men, uh, many of them call it an outline method. I don't like that term because it, it means, to me, an outline means uh, uh, A sub one, sub two, sub three, B sub two, sub three, you know, that kind of thing. And, and I, I think for <laughs> ease of uh, remembering it, I call it synopsis. Um, it's like a film treatment. When screenwriters are doing there are early ideas for a story that will do what they call a treatment. And it's the same thing, it's a synopsis. Um, for me? Um, <laughs> no more alimony. No more. Um, anyway, um, the syn a synopsis method, famous people who do that, Ken Follett. He did. He's very famous. He, he, I, there's a book out um, called uh, Writing a Blockbuster Novel. It's by his agent slash uh, editor, a guy by the name of Al Zuckerman. Excellent book. And, and Zuckerman uses uh, Follett as, as an example. He uses uh, Follett as, uh, as, as an example, and he shows the draft after draft after draft that kept expanding for the book, uh, The Man from St. Petersburg a pretty early work of uh, Ken Follett's. And he shows how he, how he built the story and how many things changed along the way from draft to draft to draft. Another one, uh, the late uh, thriller writer Rob, Robert Ludlum. He would write these scenarios that would get up to 100 pages long uh, before he would actually get down to writing the book itself. And by that time, he had figured so many things out and, and both of these writers that figure so many things out that, that writing the novel itself was basically a matter of translating it into scenes, expanding the scenes, and, and making everything work. The important thing and the reason I gave you these examples is there is no one right method of writing a novel. None. It's a matter of your own disposition, your own personality, your own comfort zones in, your, in, in how things work for you best. And you can, if you're a very uh, OCD guy like I am, you will love the plotter kind of thing. And you'll be very, very detailed and meticulous and want to have everything figured out in advance. And I get the fun by writing scenes. When I write the scenes, I know what, I know how many scenes there are going to be in a chapter, but I don't know exact, I don't have any idea maybe what the dialogue's going to be. I don't know exactly how the characters are going to interact. Uh, in my first book, I introduced this funny character, at least everybody tells me he's funny. Um, uh, he is a researcher. He is morbidly obese. This guy's like 500 pounds. And he is a researcher, and, and I play off that. I, I, he, he's based on somebody I knew as a researcher in Washington. And, um, but this character, the one that I wrote, takes off wildly 
from that point. And, um, and I, I call him, he has a nickname, Wonk, W-O-N-K. And Wonk, I, when I introduced him, I had a vague idea of what he was gonna be like. But when I wrote the scene where uh, Dylan Hunter, the hero, and Wonk meet, or, or meet in an office, hilarity ensues. I had no idea what was going to happen. I knew he was going to go in. Uh, Wong had to give him some information, some files, and things like that. I had no idea what was going to happen. I just let him let him go, and I was laughing as I'm writing this stuff. I said, "Oh, he's so funny!" You know, he's funny. He? <clears throat> Excuse me, Robert. These are imaginary people. Um, um, but but I had a grand time with that, and there are many many other uh, scenes in these books that uh, I really enjoy. Because when I get down to the scene level, it's purely creative for me. It's like seat of the pants. I put the characters in there. I know what the scene is supposed to accomplish. And I know who the characters are. I've got, I've got a good sense of who they are now. But I just let them go. I just turn them loose. And, and, and I have great fun with that. So my method is I start with a theme, a controversial theme. I have put the characters, major characters that I orchestrate who are in conflict over the thematic premise of the story. In, in, in uh, Hunter, it was the criminal justice system and what I perceive to be based on my old Reader's Digest experiences of uh, leniency within the criminal justice system, undue leniency. And so I put the characters are all in, on collision courses in this book over that subject. And I turn it into a thriller because people who definitely you don't want to meet in dark places are being released from prison or, or diverted away from prison and so on. And this thriller is based on that. And the arguments going back and forth about who, should, who these people are and why they should have been released, etc. And so I created an entire structure of characters in here who are at war on all of this. And of course my hero, uh, I can tell you this much, he is a vigilante. And he is a vigilante not by desire or peak or anything like that, but because 